And hopefully this will stimulate uh, many more conversations throughout the school. I'm sorry, is that my question? Good question. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Yep. So far, we've been doing all the experiments on the ground. However, it's been actually quite interesting efforts from both NASA and ESA to review what can be done with fundamental physics with quantum technologies in space. And uh, there is a cold atom and space survey for, as a result of the workshop requested by ESA. And there is ongoing NASA Decado survey, which will decide direction of biological and physical sciences at NASA, where those experiments belong for now, for the next 10 years. Is that too loud or okay? Good. So why would we like to actually search for fundamental physics in space? Well, the only reason why we, can, we would like to do it is there are some experiments which we just can't do on the ground. Let's put it this way, the cost of space experiments is so high that you only do it if you really can't do it on Earth. And there is a very good reason to send them to space. And this is why actually we're now very much looking for more collaborations with particle physics community to get more and more motivations of different interesting signals and different problems to solve in space. So, so far, here is what we know. They've been very, very, very few quantum technologies demonstrated in space. One most obvious one is GPS, but those are hot atoms. Those are not really those high precision things which I have shown. The precision there, it's about eight, uh, seven to eight orders of magnitude worse than we can do right now. So then uh, there is a microwave cold clock. So it's a pretty much a cold version of what we have on GPS, which we demonstrated notice a year, 2017. That's pretty much up to five years ago. We didn't have anything quantum in space. Well, besides obviously the uh, GPS clocks. Then they have been NASA deep space atom clock. That's still not an optical clock. That's a microwave. There have not been any optical clocks which I discussed yesterday demonstrated in space so far. Uh, then there is a mild sounded rocket. Uh, it's sounding rocket has a few minutes of the free flight demonstrated uh, in Germany and demonstrated cold atom by the Einstein condensation and atom interferometry. And then there is a cold atom lab, which is operated by NASA uh, on International Space Station. And essentially it does bust the Einstein condensate and there's been an interferometry module installed. And uh, I've actually seen in GPS the version of it. Uh, there are seven lasers inside the box in there, plus uh, a BEC, which is produced actually on a chip. So this is about like that big box. So, and the astronauts actually inserted the module with atom interferometry, and they've been another upgrade soon. And then uh, they have been a demonstration of uh, entanglement distribution from chain. That's a full list. And you see all the stuff has pretty much last five years. So uh, the technologies, however, are finally getting more and more mature that there is actually hope we can deploy them in space fairly soon. Fairly soon being on a 10 to 20 years time scale. So why would they like to do it? First, there are many practical reasons uh, to do so, but I will talk about the fundamental ones. The first thing is that for many experiments, especially as a test of gravity, we simply have to be not on Earth's surface. And this goes for the general relativity test. It goes for the dark energy and for the dark energy because dark energy, uh, if it's a field, it's screened by either Earth's gravitational fields or its derivatives. And surprisingly, it actually goes for some of the dark matter searches because the dark matter with this phi square quadratic interaction, um, you can show that they're actually screened by the gravitational potential as well. Uh, instead of double wall potential, you end up uh, with a different potential and uh, you need to be about uh, Earth's radius away to fully get rid of the screening potential there which makes for a very interesting conclusion. It's possible there are going to be differential shift and fundamental constants on Earth's surface in about 6,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. People have been tested for, testing for that so far. 
Uh, and then, of course, testing various fundamental physics postulates, for example, VEP tests already also, if you remove the gravitational potential, it's just so much easier to do so. So next, uh, different also GR tests need access to variable gravitational potential because to test gravity, you need to be able to vary it. And if you're stuck on Earth, our only variance is 3%. So here we can send either the satellites closer to the sun or really far away. You pretty much get fairly similar sensitivities this way. There are also occasional rogue planets passing through the solar system. If you can actually put a clock on the sun, if that would be one of them. Uh, fantastic tests as well. But again, we have to be ready to actually do so. And then, for some experiments, you just need long baselines. For all of the gravitational wave detection in space, we are talking about million miles between the satellites. In any of the, <clears throat> those inverse square law tests for the dark energy tests, also we are talking about very long baselines. You just can't do those on Earth. And then, of course, <clears throat> your solar system has a lot of cool objects like the sun, the moon, the asteroids, and all of those can be used for fundamental physics. Questions? Now, on for some detailed experiments. First, uh, moon, planets, asteroids, and quantum sensors. So why the moon? Experimentalists look at the moon and wonder. Three cryogenic, because there are parts of the moon on craters on the poles, which I actually never see the sun. It's a permanent cryogenic environment for free. And then it's actually pretty good vacuum, which already removes a lot of uh, unnecessary complications of the large scale uh, vacuum pipes, which also need to be cryogenic. But most importantly, apparently moon has very little seismic activity. They don't know exactly how little, but the Apollo missions actually had some of the seismographers uh, on the moon. And apparently on the backside of the moon, they haven't seen any seismic activity except little micrometeorites seeing the moon. Whether they actually haven't seen it or weren't sensitive enough, it wasn't obvious. And unfortunately, when Apollo mission ended, do you know what NASA did? They turned them off. Otherwise, we will have the seismic data for like a decade to come. But uh, new Artemis mission already actually has uh, missions in place to put new seismographers on the moon to sort it out. Uh, then there are also proposals for gravitational wave detection. If you're interested how to detect gravitational waves on the moon or with the moon, like the entire moon, it's a huge resonant bar. Then there is a GGI workshop actually on gravitational wave detection on the moon, which is actually quite fascinating and very ambitious. And there have been a lot of interesting other ideas of how to use uh, asteroids to either detect gravitational waves or fifth forces or dark matter probes as well. And uh, again, that's a very new effort. And the reason why now it's because NASA had the Benio Azaris Rex mission, which essentially landed a satellite on the asteroid that actually picked a piece of the asteroid and then left. Surprising things happen. Apparently the asteroid surface was not like a moon landing. It's not, there was a solid landing. Apparently it started just falling through kind of, uh, you know, those children playgrounds with lots of uh, those colorful balls. That seemed to be sort of what happened. So it grabbed whichever it needed to grab and uh, uh, very quickly left. So that was a bit of unexpected apparently thing. So now actually that mission is on the way back to earth. It's going to drop off the sample and then actually go to another asteroid. So interesting things happening there. And the reason why it's relevant is because in order for them to land anything on an asteroid, they've been tracking that asteroid for a very long time. So there is an orbital data which are extremely accurate. So tracking asteroids give you asteroidal precession data and the precession of uh, planets and asteroids is actually could be affected by dark matter or extra forces. That's why you can actually extract those limits. And uh, this idea of a gravitational wave detection essentially assumes you're placing clocks on asteroids and you use asteroids and test masses. And when gravitational wave passes, 
is there is a difference in distance and this is measurable with already currently existing clocks. So there's lots of interesting ideas. So this is one of the proposals uh, which uh, GPL have been involved in. And the idea here, it's much more straightforward. And this is something which is probably achievable. It could probably fly in 10 years, 10 to 15 years. So the idea is to pretty much pack the clock, which I showed you the picture of, in a satellite and send it to the, some reasonably high orbit. So it's a geo orbit. And then uh, you put it in elliptical orbit around Earth. So in this case, it's about 5,000 to 22,000 kilometers. And uh, the reason why you want to do it, it's to actually measure, directly measure the redshift. So there's an optical frequency link and you compare the Earth's clock with the satellite clock uh, at different points in the orbit. And those are, would be identical clocks with as good stability as possible. For example, those lattice clocks, which I showed yesterday. And then you can actually test a normal redshift. And all it is, is the dependence of frequency on the potential. So remember I told you yesterday, the clocks now can detect like a millimeter of the shift. So that's why they can actually do that gravitational uh, redshift test. So this is the best uh, available right now with a Galileo satellite, you can do 30,000 times better with this setup. There are additional benefits. This clock will also allow comparison to any other clocks in the world. So the only way really to compare clocks on different continents and do it for the dark matter searches is to actually have a clock in space. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't exactly matter what orbit it is, it has to be high enough orbit to be within visibility and for satellite not to move too fast. So the ISS unfortunately is not suitable. It moves too fast. You only get like 15 minutes of visibility data between continents, which is not enough. Also, you have to place this clock outside of the ISS for this point, because uh, as a theorist, we never think about those things. I said, oh, come on, it can be inside. And you just put a fiber link, you know, optics, and like people stared at me like, no one, no one is let you to drill holes in the ISS. So, and that makes perfect sense to me now, of course. <clears throat> so as theorists, we really have to remember there are consequences of what we actually propose. So, uh, so this is one of the uh, missions which can actually reasonably fly soon. And uh, this is the one which is a more uh, ambitious. So we were inspired by the Parker Solar Probe. Who knows what the Parker Solar Probe is? Anyone? I suggest Googling it. It's amazing. They send a satellite to the sun. It effectively touched the solar corona. It was like 4 million miles away from the, sun, from the sun's surface. And surprisingly, it didn't die. So there is a sufficient thermal shield. So it's actually going to pass closer in the next flyby. So it's an elliptical flyby, and there are going to be several approaches to the sun. And it was actually measuring magnetic fields and uh, was measuring the uh, particles, uh, different particles near the sun. So it's a science mission, and it was fantastic. It actually was fairly recent, about a couple of months ago, when it was on the close approach so far. And we were thinking about, OK, let's say we can actually put some quantum devices in there. What would they measure? And here we come to the idea that dark matter, remember, can cluster. Especially ultralight dark matter with certain interactions can actually clump significantly. In fact, you can actually make any of the dark matter gravitationally bound to any of the standard model object. But if you have ultralight dark matter, you can actually make uh, uh, reasonably dense objects. And uh, if, you, if they're bound gravitationally to a standard model object like the sun, they can't explode. If they're not bound, actually there's been a papers and actual stars eventually would explode. So, or the scalar, we're actually working now looking for scalar stars. And uh, this is very interesting. And why, is that, why do we care? The reason why we care, it's simply that if such dark matter exists, it's much, much easier to detect it near the sun. Why? Because there's simply more of it. If you have a halo bound to the sun, uh, it's been computed that you can actually have over densities, and this is a density comparing to normal halo. This is a halo dark matter, and you can have for the ultralight dark matter 10 to the minus 13 AV range, which is actually well within the clock range, you actually can have 10 to the 17, 10 to the 17 for every one particle of dark matter 
on Earth, you can have 10 to the 17 dark matter particles there. And by the way, this is in no way uh, creates any extra dark matter density because so there's a little bit extra masses to each star. It's not really affecting anything. By the way, there are no bounds for it because the only bounds which we have on dark matter density in the solar system, it's not a dark matter density, it's a density of extra matter. It's how the planetary orbits are affected by the matter. We can't tell the difference between normal matter and dark matter. We also don't have any limits which are inside the Mercury orbit. Mercury is the best limit uh, which we have, which means we really have absolutely no idea whatsoever how much dark matter we are allowed actually in the sun or around the sun. As I said, some ridiculous estimates give about 5%. So it'd be nice to have, if you have friends who are solar physicists, ask them to calculate it based on luminosities. But again, I talk to them and they say, well, we probably end up with a few percent anyway. Like a few percent of the sun mass can be dark matter and we can, we wouldn't know about it. It sounds ridiculous. Like literally, I just couldn't believe it. But there is no limit. There is a 10 to the minus eight solar mass limit on a total extra matter allowable in the solar system. But a total extra matter. So uh, the idea of this mission is actually very straightforward. You simply pack your two clock comparison. You do not need an optical link to Earth. You just need a data transfer. And all you do, you just send it closer to the sun. Only, you only need a few hours on elliptical bypass around the sun. And you'll actually get much more than that. And uh, if it's there, you'll find it. Notice there is profiles very mass dependent. It's dependent on the mass of the dark matter because it's dependent on the mass and the radius of the sun. So it's a very, it's, it's, if this scale exists, it exists for very specific masses which is quite interesting. But you have over densities for very long range. Okay, now we get to more exotic cases. As I said, this dark matter oscillations, it's kind of the most reasonable idea because you've seen, you write a Hamiltonian, you end up with a, you write the Lagrangian which has deltonic coupling or a Higgs coupling, you automatically end up with variation of fundamental constants. However, you can actually be more inventive. People have looked uh, at various dark matter clubs, which are monopoles or one dimensional strings or two dimensional sheets would pretty much be your domain walls. Whether those things are called, that's a very good question, especially for domain walls. But let's say such thing exists, it could be earth sized. So when it's passing through, it actually desynchronizes all the networks. And that's why you need a long baseline. And that's been an interesting suggestion. And uh, uh, people are happily started analyzing the clock data to actually look for those things. And there is a big controversy in literature right now, whether those things exist and whether they are cold. Questions? Yes. Uh, for the for the satellite that would be outside the International Space Station, mm -hmm. didn't you say that we need uh, fiber optic cables in order to communicate clock information on Earth? So what's the solution for communicating clocks right. that are not connected? Okay. An uh, excellent question. So it's possible to actually do free space transfer. You can, because all it is, so it's possible to do a free space transfer optical link. So the problem with ISS is a bit separate. So there are two separate questions. It's good to have a clock inside ISS, just because an Austrian is kind of reasonably easy to fix things, because this is a complicated device. But for it to talk to Earth, it essentially needs to be a telescope, which sends photon to Earth. And uh, there is just a technical issue of how do you get these photons out of the outside the ISS. But uh, in order to, if your question is how to communicate between the satellite or is outside of ISS with Earth, it, it, this is fairly well understood. So uh, you have telescopes on both sides and you essentially have a laser link. Why so that we can't do it on Earth? Ah, because we cannot do it on Earth because in free space, you have a, first the atmosphere 
kills the signal pretty quickly. So there have been a demonstration of 300 kilometer transfer uh, between, but not for high precision clocks, between uh, two islands in the Pacific. But mostly if you actually go from Earth to space, you only have a 10 kilometers of the atmosphere. But eventually atmosphere on Earth will kill the signal. Also, there is a curvature. So you can, you really have to connect it to something higher flying. And the other point, if it's an ISS, ISS actually uh, orbits Earth for 90 minutes. So again, it moves too fast. Uh, These links have not been demonstrated to space. They also have not been demonstrated yet to anything which is flies more than a drone, faster than a drone. So uh, it's fairly challenging and uh, it will have to be a high orbit. Even if you don't want to actually do the tests of GR, it still has to be su sufficiently high orbit for the high precision link to work. Like we really want 10 to the minus 18 optical transfer. So there have been very, very few recent tests of how to do it actually on Earth. And uh, that's why there is a, one of the issues with those clock proposals is that link have not been demonstrated to space. Frequency comps have been demonstrated on sounding, I think on the, either sounding rocket or the uh, high flights. So, but it's understood that this is a technical issue. So, but this is one of the reasons why we would like those clocks in space. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, then other ideas that if those domain walls exist, we actually don't have wait to wait for them to actually cross paths with Earth. Apparently, if such topological type fields exist anywhere, then the Earth is going to actually have a screening effect around it automatically, regardless of whether this dark um, domain wall passing through or not. If there's one exist anywhere in the universe, uh, there's been a paper saying that there has to be, there is a screening field. And in this case, there is a differential in fundamental constants between Earth's surfaces and about radius away. People have looked for it right now. Uh, this is actually the Tokyo Sky Tree. So uh, Tokyo Sky Tree, it's a very high tower in Tokyo, about 400 meters. They put one clock at the bottom and one on top and they actually looked for the uh, differential and the signal, which is pretty much the measure the height of the Tokyo Sky Tree Tower. It agrees with GR, which is not unexpected. So, the, but the, in space, you can actually, if this field exists, there could be actually some interesting differential signals. So as you see, that's kind of more exotic ideas people are thinking about looking for. Now, another even more exotic idea is whether there is a multi-messenger astronomy signal which is linked to LIGO signal, LIGO detection gravitational waves. So if anyone interesting to think about how those uh, waves propagate in space when they actually have a mass, that's not a solved problem. So uh, why would they be such a wave? So think about, you have two black holes. There already been papers that around those black holes, you can actually have uh, clouds of axioms for various reasons. And those clouds are essentially bound to the black hole in a way the hydrogen atom is bound. So it's almost the same effect. Now think about what happens when they merge. Because when they merge, they will go to different excited states. The effect is nearly the same as ejecting electron out of the atom. So the entire field can get ejected with the relativistic velocities during the merge of black hole. And uh, this paper has estimated that this field will get there with only a kind of... Uh, uh, a little bit of a delay comparing to the pulse, gravitational wave detection pulse. So the idea is that this is potentially detectable with either clock networks of magnetomet or magnetometers, but now this is relativistic front. This is not called dark matter anymore. They've been, of course, immediately comment on the archive that uh, first, no one could calculate the spectra of whatever that energy of that ejected field, they have been actually calculation for explosion of axion stars, but not for this one. And then the second, if it's a quadratically coupled field, they've been uh, uh, a question of whether the dispersion will mean that we'll actually never get here. And if it does get here, it will be not distinguishable as a uh, signal 
of multi-messenger astronomy. So this is a completely open question, uh, which actually we've been starting to look uh, with other particle physicists and cosmologists as well. So the question, so those trends and signals is completely open right now. And uh, that's one uh, interesting and potentially uh, very significant observation, especially if coincidental with LIGO or, or future LISA. And then uh, the other thing is that if you actually know the orbits of the different objects in the solar system very, very well, you can conceivably actually constrain the gravity in the solar system. And if you constrain the gravity, you can either constrain the dark matter or you're constraining the neutrinos, for example. And then actually the constraint of the cosmic neutrino uh, profile to the senior B, it's actually not much worse than from Katrin which you got. And this in principle could be much improved if you figure out how to do it for the distance between asteroids because that could be measured very, very precisely. Because the distance to asteroids when measured from Earth is uh, actually limited by our not understanding of the Earth itself. So there is a, a bit of uncertainty essentially where the center of the mass Earth is. And this is one of the uncertainties. Also, there is an atmosphere. But if you actually do space-to-space -space comparison, that's a very different thing. So you can measure that much more accurately eventually. And they're trying to figure out how you can use those clocks, uh, accelerometers, and various other quantum sensors to actually get uh, much more precise positions of various objects in the solar system, just well because you have way more asteroids and planets. So if you can technically precisely tell where all asteroids are, what their orbits are, you can actually map the dark matter in the solar system eventually. Uh, we are not there yet. The uh, uncertainty is significantly worse than the HALA uh, profile as of now. Okay, so to summarize, there are many space applications of atomic clocks. So I only talked about fundamental physics, but the clocks will enable one-way navigation. And that's actually something which was completely new to me. So presumably most people at some point watch some sort of, uh, you know, movie or a TV show where there was some astronauts in some ship, right? Presumably. And well, they look at the type on the navigation computer or says computer calculate or tell me, you know, get me to that planet or whatever. And I always thought that if you send a mission to Mars, it'd be like this. It's not going to be. Because as of now, if you're doing what we are doing with navigation, the ship with people which will send to Mars would have no idea where it is until it else tells it where it is. Because right now, the way we are navigating everything in the solar system is that the Earth, NASA, for example, has three very large dishes which send micro radio signals. And that satellite actually gets this radio signal and, and essentially the transponder just sends it back. And when the Earth gets a signal back, it gets a navigational check of where the trajectory is. And then eventually it plots a trajectory and then does a navigational solution for the satellite. Do you understand the problem with this? There is a 14 minute delay for orbital insertion into mass orbit, which is that you will not know where you are. You know, that's why people have been losing satellites for once. And uh, there is a very simple solution. And uh, as a solution, you have to have a clock on board. Because if you have a clock on board, then you know what time it is. If you know what time it is, you know where it is. The reason why the GPS type clocks don't work for this, it's because they have too big drifts. That thing has to be essentially reasonably independently working from anything. So, and the sensitivity is actually of this um, DSA clock, the mercury clock. You don't need those precision optical clock. You just need this mercury uh, plus microwave clock for that. You need 10 to the minus 15 stability per day. And in this case, it works differently. There is a one-way navigation. And the one-way navigation, you actually send uh, the satellite itself gets a signal from Earth and the signal is modulated. So it can actually compute when that was sent. And because now satellite know what time it has, it actually computes the distance independently and could do navigational solution independently. Also, it's much cheaper and you can track much more satellites because with two-way navigation, you can track two at a time, period. With this Benio satellites, they actually spend three days uh, doing two-way navigation, which was very, very expensive. And the more actually different crafts we have on the solar system, the worse this bottleneck with navigation gets. With one nav nav navigation, you just send the signal. You don't need to compute anything. The satellite computes it on your own, which is very bizarre. I couldn't believe it. I, I literally had the people from JPL explain it to me. Because I read the paper, it's like, 
really is that how that works so if i've uh, skyped uh, or uh, whatever webex uh, uh, some people are now on gpl and they explained to me yep that's that's how that works now and actually there's supposed to be a navigational demonstration on veritas mission to venus and as of now that clock actually is not part of that mission so it will be actually good if it's if we're trying to get it back so and in terms of sending six to space just to have an extra clock on board in veritas mission it's a 70 million price tag and I don't know how much mission itself is cost on top of this. And because it's technology demonstration, if you don't have money, that's the first thing they cut. So we will see as in terms of quantum sensor programs, they can actually include it back. And uh, as you see, this is a completely practical things, but again, as theorists, it's always useful to know what those devices for besides, uh, because then we know actually what they can be used for. In principle, various links can actually always be, also can be used uh, for various dark matter searches themselves. Now, VLBI, and we talked a little bit about it, so if you actually do VLBI in space, you do need much more precise clocks on those nodes, and then the earth sciences, and then the dark matter searches, variation of fundamental constants, lots of various tests of GR, tests of position invariance, international time reference, uh, and in the future gravitation wave detection. Okay, questions. So this is the end of my uh, space, almost the end of my space part of the talk. So no one is surprised, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so it's not related to this part, but something earlier when mm -hmm. you mentioned the solar probe. So yes. You said that could come close and that it had a thermal shield, but is this shield also good enough that if you put two atomic clocks on it, their performance is- uh, Apparently so. We actually, uh, that's because that paper with the two particle theorists and with me being a theorist, I was a bit concerned about those clocks won't just die there. So we first, we actually emailed the Parker Solar Pro people and they send us the data on the magnetic field and the temperature distribution. And it looks like uh, it's not prohibitive. But then I also emailed the GPL people who do clocks and they tell me, oh, such a great idea. But we proposed in 2001 to send four microwave clocks to like a close to the sun, just 10 solar radius away, which is much closer than we want to send them. So apparently GPL looked at it. And it looks like it's it's possible. Yes, you will need to do full sim full scale simulations of exactly what the uncertainties would be. But the most uncertainty with clocks usually come from the environmental differential. So if you actually use a single ion and two different transition and ion, that will kill most of the dependence on the environment as well. And uh, you're already operating all clocks with magnetic sensitive transition insensitive transitions because magnetic shifts are very big. So you always operate on the states uh, which uh, has uh, magnetic uh, uh, moment zero. So because magnetic field is one of the biggest issues. So if you really get to the Parker solar probe limit, then magnetic fields eventually will become uh, very large. And there is like a second order Zeeman shifts and other things. But uh, it looked like at least, uh, you know, we, we've talked to a number of experimentalists that uh, it should be manageable. But again, somebody will eventually be actually looking and potentially running the full scale simulations for the focus mission now for the orbital data and so on. Other questions? Now, I mean, are there projects aimed to the detection of gravitational waves with their arrays, arrays of atomic clocks? Yes. So uh, there are, in fact, you don't need a race, you just need two atomic clocks. I will, if I have time, I'll show a little bit uh, on those proposals. So there are two, there are, uh, two types of proposals. So uh, the first proposals are in the Desigers, uh, Desigers range. That's between LISA, which is going to space, and LIGO. And there is ideas, because you're dealing with now a different system, you actually don't need a three uh, satellite because uh, three satellites, you just need two. So you either, there are proposed with atom interferometers on both sides, and essentially uh, those interferometers are almost used as clocks. So they're using the same clock transitions, but in this case, uh, the difference between clock proposals and uh, interferometer proposals is that uh, in the case of clocks, there are physical test masses, and then the test masses are attached to the mirror. And then the clock will actually essentially measure the distance between the two mirrors. So it's kind of very similar in part by uh, as LIGA, only you do it in space and your test masses 
uh, but the test masses are still physical test masses and like it's actual mirrors. Uh, and the clocks then uh, measure essentially the distance between those two mirrors and see how it changes. With atom interferometry, the atoms themselves are actually test masses. In this case, there are no physical, like actually literally heavy thing, which is a test mass. And in this case, what they measure is they measure accelerations between those two masses due to gravitational waves. In this case, the masses are just atomic clouds. They're fairly big atomic clouds, maybe 10 to the 10 atoms. So those are uh, two sets of proposals. And there is a separate set of proposals to measure the gravitational waves to the left frequency of LISA between the pulse of timing array and between LISA. I'll show the graph for that. And that's the one when you actually use asteroids for test, as test masses, you need like a kilometer scale object. And uh, you literally put clocks on orbits between asteroids, and then you have a link to the asteroid itself to measure the distance to the asteroid. And uh, you connect them with telescopes and the clocks literally measure the distance, the time passes between the asteroids and uh, that measures the distance. You need to measure it to like a micron. And they compute that 10 minus 18 clock already can measure distance on, to a micron on astronomical scales. So that's pretty much current proposals. So the answer is yes. And uh, for uh, that's one of the reasons we want to start sending some quantum sensors to space that eventually, eventually will build gravitation wave observatories from quantum sensors in space, because there are simply no other solutions in some of the ranges. The data hertz, you can also build stuff on the moon, but we are talking about kilometer scale objects on the moon that actually may be simpler to use atom interferometers in space. Other questions? And of course, there is a very big question. I'm surprised no one asked. How do you send this to space? <clears throat> Especially since there are a lot of stuff which is just plugged into the wall. Well, that actually looks daunting, but this is not. So this is exactly the same clock as this one. Only people actually took care to pack it in a nice uh, boxes <laughs> and uh, make it a little bit smaller. So this is actually this Tokyo Sky Tree experiment. So this is one clock and this is the whole thing at second clock. So this is 1.3 meters. Now that still plugs into the wall, but the power distribution, you know, it, it's not that bad. So we think we can fit it to about 300 kilograms. So it's a big satellite, but not that big. Now, of course, one of the issues that you see is a lot of laser boxes. Pretty much none of the clock lasers are qualified for space, but NASA or ESA knows how to do it, and that's what they do for a living. There are a lot of lasers being sent to space. And uh, uh, in principle, in Cold Atom Lab on ISS, there are seven lasers in that box, and they all seem to work. So this is not unreasonable at this point. That's why we're thinking that we're actually advancing fairly rapidly uh, and you see this is 2021, and there are several portable clocks in different countries at this point. So people have put them on the van and actually had field demonstrations with them as well. Okay. And now uh, let's make a break, and then we'll talk about axions and EDMs. And if you have questions, please come see me. Better? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I have updated the website. I didn't put this lecture yet uh, since I wasn't sure whether we get to the end of it or not. And if not, that's okay. Uh, but I did put a link to the Action Dark Matter paper, Scalar Dark Matter paper, Survey for the Wave Like Dark Matter. And uh, also, I put this paper on Axiogenesis uh, link to the site uh, for the matter antimatter symmetry. And I also put the link to the talk about the axiom production, which has everything you want to know about axiom production, like strings, domain walls, before inflation, after inflation, everything. So it's a, it's a very nice talk actually here in GGI. Now, detecting axions. First, let's just see that there is, just say that this is a ultralight dark matter is a very fast growing community. In the United States, one of the biggest meetings where particle physicists go is April meeting is nuclear and a particle physics meeting. And this is just a number of abstract. Now this is for WIMP dark matter. This is for the axion dark matter, and this is both. And as you see is a number of axion 
abstracts now is about the same as WIMPs. So, and there are both experimental and theory efforts uh, in this regard. So at least in the US, a number of uh, also letters of intent submitted to the uh, Snowmass survey pretty much kind of equaled out at this point. So now ultralight dark matter is a fairly significant effort and comparable to the particle dark matter, at least in the US. I'm not sure what's the how landscape looks like in Europe. Just a very short review, the axion, QCD axion solves a strong CP problem that this term should break the CP symmetry, G is the gluonic tensor, but for some reason it doesn't. And this comes from non-observation of uh, neutron EDM. And we talked a little about it before. So according to the observation of, uh, uh, or non-observation of nuclear, uh, of neutron EDM at 10 to the minus 26 level, you end up with a theta being 10 to the minus 10. And of course, we are always bothered by an unusually small weird numbers in all the Lagrangians. So it looks like there has to be a reason for it, especially the theta prime actually come from two different terms, one from hadronic sector, one from the weak interaction sector. And it's really unclear why those two things cancel precisely to zero. And uh, the solution is the quinn mechanism is that you just think, okay, that's not a constant. It's a dynamic field. So it starts with its value being, for example, large, and then it relaxes to zero. And uh, the symmetry is spontaneously broken at some scale. And actually, the relation of that scale to the inflation, that what uh, uh, makes a difference in terms of those production mechanisms, as we have shown. So in this case, uh, from the chiral perturbation theory, you can actually connect the decay constant and the mass of the action very precisely. And uh, if you have uh, this happen actually after the inflation, you can actually get some limits to its mass and it's a fairly narrow sector. If it happens before the inflation, there are no limits for the mass because in this case, uh, you have an additional parameter which is, was accidentally defined in the observable universe. So in this case, in principle, theoretically right now, the QCD action is not appearing to be restricted in mass. And experimentalists are very, some of the experimentalists are very unhappy about it. In fact, I've been to the conference when the people from uh, a microwave cavity essentially saying, no, no, the action is like from 10 to the minus three electron volt, 10 to the minus six electron volts. And the theory is like, but, but we explained to you that it only happens under certain conditions. And there are all the other conditions in which case the QCD action can have any mass whatsoever, which is not forbidden by the experiment. There are uh, a number of different searches. So remember, we discussed there are different couplings of actions. So I wrote all of them on the board. So you have here the coupling uh, to the photons through the Primakov process. So essentially, you can convert between two gamma, two photons and one axion. You can couple axion directly to gluons, or you can actually couple to fermions like electrons. And now the searches actually had been using all three. So those existing heloscopes, heloscopes are those microwave cavity, uh, realizing running experiments, all the red indicate those using all the red using the photon axion photon couplings. And uh, then there is a blue, which actually using now alternative couplings. And in this case, the Casper Electric actually using this coupling and Ariadne just, it's a fifth force experiment. Then uh, if action exists, it's also induces a fifth force. <clears throat> so as you see, there are quite a lot of different experiments <clears throat> and that's where we are. Again, if you're interested, you can actually go to the Sierra and Harris website and you can plot those plots yourselves. This is a, this yellow thing, that's a QCD action line. To rule out QCD action, you need to be right here. It actually, this goes all the way down too. And as you see, there is only a very, very, very few parts of the parameter space which are ruled out. So the action essentially is nearly completely experimentally unexplored at this time. <clears throat> Despite, yes, a decade of effort or more than a couple of decades of effort, but now actually we finally hope to get there. So this is a very basic idea of those resonant cavity, cavity halo scopes. So how do we 
like how do those actually work? So this I experiments, this ADMX and the cap and the haystack. He is actually very simple. Yes. I don't know, but I'm sure it's in this paper. So uh, uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, but at least this paper, which will have a reference to this paper. So definitely, because those graphs are from there. That's a good question. But as you see, the axions cannot be heavy. So they are, they are, the QCD axion above 10, uh, above, uh, 10 AV has been pretty much ruled out at this point. So other questions? <clears throat> OK. Basic idea of axions, make a cavity. The cavity is resonant. Essentially, you want your axion wavelengths exactly fit the cavity. That's why they're so narrow band. That's why it's so principal for them to actually have some prediction for the dark, for the QCD action mass. Because literally, you need to actually change the physical size of the cavity to move the scanning. And the scan rate is very low. The larger the cavity, the worse is the scan rate. And eventually, of course, you run out of possibility of actually making the cavities either too small or too big. So that's why we've done this exercise for 10 to the minus 6 EV. Remember, the wavelength was 130 centimeters. So reasonable cavity size. What happens? The action comes in. And as you put it in as large magnetic field as possible, magnetic field provides a virtual photon and essentially this is converted to photon. So this is that easy. You're converting action to photon. And actions are there just because there is a halo. And now all you need is just extract this photon by some detector. And uh, what you're going to see, you're going to see the spike in the power of the cavity at the photon frequency, which is proportional to the action mass. So from that, you can actually get action mass. And this is pretty much the radio. All you do, you just look at the modes electromagnetic field. So in principle, it's very simple. Experimental practice is complicated because you need as good magnets as possible. And uh, also a lot of those things eventually have to be cryogenic, uh, et cetera. So. And also you need lots of them. So there is a, the whole building in uh, South Korea, which is actually has several different uh, action experiments to just different size cavities to, for different ranges. But as you, you understand why the scanning rate is low, it's because you are literally connected to the physical size of the cavity. You can change the size of the cavity, but not by much. Also that parameter space is very hard to reach. It takes a long time to scan for the specific wavelengths. However, we think that we'll get there. So this is a projection from this action dark matter paper for the snow mass. We think in 10 years, we'll be right here. And that's, as you see, very, very ambitious. So we think there is within 10 to 15 years, there is a good way to actually move through most of the action, QCD action parameter space. That's why there is actually very heavy potential for discovery there, since action is a really very good solution to CP problem, strong CP problem, and we really don't have many other ones. Actually, we don't have pretty much any other good ones. Uh, there is also one experiment you haven't shown, the Casper Electric, which actually will cover this area as well. Uh, you can see new names for the experiments. You can still see the DMX, but there is this Mad Max and Alpha. And uh, those are new ideas of the electric hyloscopes. In this case, you're actually not connecting directly the scanning rate to the cavity size. So there are many other ideas. Uh, however, the one thing which is great, if you could actually measure beyond the standard quantum limit, just because you can significantly increase the scanning rate. And I wanted to show you one example how that works in a real experiment. Since Haystack, which is action experiment, it's the only tabletop experiment which has practically actually used this squeezing, the measurement beyond this quantum limit. So any questions about this one? Yes. Oh, because the QCD action has these two things directly connected. So it can only be within this yellow line. 
So the QCD axion, it's, it's a very, very specific beast. If you, you just need to be under the yellow line. You, if you rule it out, if you're under the yellow line. That's why essentially, and honestly, it's already you know, difficult to read there, but you see the yellow line kind of ends right here. So the masses, which are heavier than this, pretty much it was ruled out for QCD action. Now they have not been ruled out for Alps. Alps, it's kind of like a pseudo, it's a, some pseudoscalar particle. So, and in this case, it's not solving a strong CP problem, but still those arise in various, you know, string theories, et cetera. So people actually do look on the entire parameter space, but here uh, you actually only need to be below the yellow line. That's a great question. Yes. In the yellow line or below the yellow line? You need to, you mean below yellow line. Uh, also, yeah, you need to be like right there, yeah. But if you, okay, the yellow line has some uncertainty, it's because there are different QCD action models. So that's why there's uncertainty. And people think if they actually measure the proton EDM, you somehow can constrain it a bit better. So, but this is one of the, one of the issues. This is a very, very hard to reach line. So now, how those things actually can be measured beyond the standard quantum limit? So what do we have? We have cavity. And uh, then we have some sort of measurement apparatus, which essentially extracts the signal from the cavity. And then there is action signal. So, okay, that's an action signal. That's a cavity noise. The cavity itself has inherent noise. And then there is a noise associated with the measurement procedure. So three different things, okay? How do they relate to each other? Okay, so the measurement noise, it's something you really have to connect your cavity to outside world. Then cavity itself is noisy and uh, your action signal is always scales with the cavity noise. So if you increase the cavity noise in principle, you also increase the action signal. But then because you have a measurement signal noise, then you have to make sure that you actually above the measurement signal noise. And uh, literally it's a two different noise sources which you can adjust. And uh, you can do either squeezing in one of them or the other. Okay, how does it work? The problem which you have is that the size of the simple heliscope cavity, the one which is not filled with some interesting special dielectric, which they're trying to explore right now, must scale as the axion Compton wavelength is one over mass. The scan rate is ridiculously bad. It scans as a frequency uh, at about minus 14 over three. So for higher masses, you'll be scanning for 20,000 years. That's why measuring beyond the quantum limit. Now there are ways how to solve that diff in different ways. Uh, with uh, more better heliscopes, but still the scanning rate is going to be long. So you would like to actually measure beyond the quantum limit. And the basic idea is the follow. This is your noise. This is your noise from the cavity. This is measurement noise, noise from the cavity. And this is the action signal. In other theories, I'm marveling that they can actually extract this green signal on top of that much noise. But apparently they can do so. So there are two ways you can improve this. You can either make this signal bigger or this noise smaller. And they've tried to do both. So first, any questions about what those red, blue, and green things are? Okay. Quantum enhancement. So first version is that you reduce this noise because you, you don't do anything to the cavity noise. With quantum enhancement, you can actually reduce the noise due to measurements. And as you see, you, the scanning rate, the visibility bandwidth increases. That's why the measurement beyond the quantum limit, what it does, it increases the scanning rate. So there's a lot of interesting quantum tricks. Uh, this gives you about factor of two. Unfortunately, that turns out to be fairly difficult. So the other idea which they have, it's do it backwards. You amplify the signal which comes out of the cavity. You do actually very nice amplification. You can do it with joint conjunction, which are superconducting things. The only problem, they actually are not compatible with the magnetic uh, field. So in order to do any amplifications, you'd need to do it outside of the magnetic field, which is not possible here. So they decided to make two cavities and actually entangle two cavities. 
And uh, that actually worked. So there is a new version with quantum enhancement number two, when this measurement noise remains the same, but you're increasing the signal and with the signal, you also increase the currency noise, but that's okay. So, and that's the second different version. And noise disamplification can not be done in magnetic fields, strong magnetic fields. So now they have two cavities and they actually be able to connect the two cavities. So one are used for measurements and one for actual detection. And uh, this, what the quantum information can do for you if you actually do precision measurement experiments. And that actually had been demonstrated. So as you see, this is the first demonstration that you can actually measure beyond the standard quantum limit for dark matter searches. And we actually expect that to be more and more in the future years. <clears throat> so this, uh, uh, there is a lot of theory work in both how this can be done, various uh, systems, and uh, also how we can actually just build pretty much better microwave cavities to measure this. Yes. Questions. Okay, so here you don't need to entangle more than two because all you need to do is to make sure the amplification is done outside. So here is you see magnetic field. You only need two because you need to do amplification which is not in here. And somehow you have to connect actually readout cavity to the cavity which is actually making the measurement. So the signal comes here, but then to amplify it, you needed to put it in a different cavity. So that's what it would do. And uh, in terms of noise, I mean, any device has noise. There is simply a device associated. I'm sure there's imperfection of cavity. Again, I'm a theorist. So uh, I assume any device has noise associated with it. The point is that whatever signal you actually extract is proportional to the noise of the device. It's a measurement noise, which is a whole separate thing. But that's my extent of knowledge here. Yes. I understand. I understand entangling like quantum bits, but what exactly does it mean to entangle cavities like giant macroscopic things? So in this case, uh, maybe I'm, uh, okay. You're not entangle cavity as a, as a device. You're entangling essentially as a signal which you have inside of those cavities. So all you need to do is uh, prepare as a cavity in those states. So uh, you have some sort of essentially photonic modes in there, electromagnetic field. So what you do, you just create the same electromagnetic field in here. That's all it does. So you're not physically entangling you know, a metal device. You're simply essentially entangling the quantum states. So the quantum states of this cavity can be ported to the quantum state of this cavity. That's, that's all they do. Does that make better sense? Okay. Other questions? And uh, now I wanted to talk about a very different experiment. And uh, you know, the goal of today's lecture is just to show breadth of what people do uh, in order to detect dark matter or find other new physics. This is a completely different experiment. It's called Casper Electric. And it actually uses the gluonic coupling. So this coupling will do a very different thing. It will not produce photons. What it will do, it will induce EDMs, oscillating EDMs in the nuclei. So it will have an oscillating electric dipole moment. And in this case, what happens is that you have a certain, you have a bunch of spins. So this is essentially uh, a box filled with some material, some solid state material. In this material, you have nuclear spins. And you have a two different states of this nuclear spin. Think about you can actually spins up or down and there is an energy difference associated with this. And what we are doing here, we actually have an axion which in, in such wavelengths that is resonant with this specific splitting of those spins. And if that happens at ensemble, the whole magnetization tilts and spin becomes to precess. And in this case, all you do, you're just detecting this precession of the spins. 
And surprisingly, the fact, despite the fact that this uh, oscillating electric dipole moment is very small, it's actually smaller than the permanent ones, which you can get, for example, for neutrons and protons, apparently it's easier to extract oscillating signals because systematic is better in this case. And this is pretty much the only experiment. As you see, it probes the QCD axiom from this 10 to the minus 8 to about 10 to the minus 12 uh, with a future set of experiments. There is nothing else which can actually probe QCD axiom uh, which is that light. So it's a very different type of experiments. And as you see, and there is, you know, several dozen of different experiments which are ongoing in this case. And uh, this is actually it for actions. Uh, are there any questions on actions? I'll show one more very cool experiments afterwards. So any questions for actions? So essentially, if QCD actions exist, at this point, we mostly know how to find them. But uh, a lot of those device experimentals, we either don't have prototypes or hope to build prototypes soon. So uh, there may be drastic progress within 10 to 15 years at this point. After many, many decades, well, a couple of decades of very little progress, as you have seen, <laughs> the very small parts of parameter space have been ruled out. And in part, as you see, that's why so many abstracts at the April meeting, because there are lots of different groups working on this of how to detect it. And lots of those ideas are all, also last five years. In part, because our technology has gotten better. The detection of magnetic fields gotten better and uh, also, uh, various uh, entanglement technologies gotten better. And understand materials gotten better as well. Okay, there have been a lot of talks about neutrino yesterday. So I thought I'll show uh, an atomic neutrino experiment. So this is an experiment to detect sterile neutrinos. And in, in part, this is kind of similar to the idea, similar to Katrin, only it's tabletop. <clears throat> okay, so you are going to put, take atom trap, the same traps as on clocks. But now put radioactive atoms in there, put cesium-131. That cesium will actually, uh, a nuclear will absorb a proton in a, uh, in a nucleus, will absorb the atomic electron, and then it will decay. So all it is, it's a nuclear decay, and uh, they believe that they can actually get all of the energies of anything which is emitted as a result of decay, obviously except neutrino. And that allows you to actually reconstruct the neutrino spectrum. And again, if there is a sterile neutrino, then you'll have a little bump uh, on the tail of this neutrino spectrum here. And they actually think that with a, a Hunter phase three, they will actually go fairly deep in the parameter space. And uh, the dashed line orange show astrophysical limits. But in this case, you actually have a lot of unexplored parameter space. So this is literally the process which they're going to be using, and they're actually working on the prototype. The link which I have sent to the special issue of the quantum science and technology had a paper on a Hunter experiment. So an actual link right here. So as you see, a very different AMO experiment. That's the only one looking for neutrino to the my knowledge at this point. It's in UCLA. And now I want to talk a little bit about the electron dipole moment. And this is a, actually now we are switching from ultralight physics to the TeV scale physics. As a basic idea of uh, this is very, very simple. If you have a TeV scale physics, which also induces extra CP violation, then think about you have an electron or actually any elementary particles. And of course, you always have a virtual cloud of your particles appearing and annihilating, and the TV particles will contribute to that as well. What they will do is a very simple idea that they will actually squash the electron or the neutron or the proton, and uh, that will therefore then possess an EDM. Now, why is that CP violating? Well, let's see what vectors do we have. So in any elementary particle, we definitely have our spin, and our spin transforms under the time reversal as an axial vector, and the dipole moment transforms as a true vector. So as we know, in an electron, you do not have any additional quantum numbers. So you have a spin, and you have the projection of the spin. So if it has a dipole moment, it has to be aligned along the spin. Otherwise, you'll have more quantum numbers describing your electron. And now, if you actually reverse it, it means that if it's aligned with a spin, 
then electric dipole moment has to be zero without the T violation because the D will not reverse, but spin does. So automatically for electric dipole moment to exist, that will automatically mean that you have new sources of CP violation. So if CPT is conserved, then if it's either T is not conserved or CP. So any questions on this? And of course, the supersymmetry is one of the possibilities which will lose it for you. And uh, we do need those new sources of CP violation to explain matter antimatter asymmetries. So pretty much all of the kind of supersymmetric symmetries uh, and uh, many, many other, so pretty much all the theories which predict TV scale physics predict existing of the EDMs. And unless you have some unusually uh, fine tune couplings to CP violating phases, which is also not good in your supersymmetric theory, then we should have started seeing EDMs five years from five years ago. And uh, if you are not actually seeing the EDMs right now, in the next 10 years, that's going to be a big, big problem for many theories. I'll show you rule out parameters for this. Okay. Now, which EDMs? If you have an atom or a molecule, you have electron EDM, you have nuclear EDM uh, of protons or neutrons, you have PT violating nuclear nuclear interaction, and you have electron nuclear interaction. And you need heavy atom or molecule because those effects are enhanced as Z cubed. So people, of course, had looked for neutron EDM, and for nuclear EDM, they look for diamagnetic atoms or molecules. And for electron EDM, you look for the paramagnetic atoms or the corresponding molecules. So as you see, there's quite a lot of different ongoing experiments with us. Now, how do we analyze those things? For the electron EDM, if you have a paramagnetic atoms or molecules, all you need to do to connect to electron EDM, actually elementary EDM, would be isotomic or molecular theory. This is accurate to a percent to a few percent, and this is accurate to about 10%. So as you see, if we do see in molecules, uh, which look at the par isoparagonetic atoms or corresponding molecules, if you actually see the EDM, we absolutely know what electron EDM is, because the recalculation is very straightforward. Again, we understand atoms or molecules pretty well. Now, the neutron EDM, that relates to QCD, and from that you can actually do the quark EDM or the quark chroma EDMs. Now, with the diamagnetic atoms, that's a problem, because the best limit right now is mercury, and people are still debating of how exactly is that actually analyzed. Because atomic theory, we understand, nuclear theory, we not so much. So interpretation of this in terms of the shift moment is more or less okay. Interpretation and shift moment is a PT violating moment in the nuclei. And um, a reduction that the quarks and glues, it's pretty, some of it is pretty controversial. So more or less we can reduce it to proton EDM or a neutron EDM, but getting the limits on actually uh, nuclear nuclear interactions is pretty difficult. So any questions? How do you measure an EDM? Take a, an electron, for example, right? If electron has an EDM and you put it in an electric field, what should happen? The energy level should shift, right? There is simple stark shift, DE. The problem is electron that it starts moving and essentially not a controllable system. So you really can't run it. It's very hard to do EDMs of charged particles. So people have done some with proton, but there's no point to do it with electrons because you actually have very nice electrons in atoms and in molecules. So also in atoms, in heavy atoms and heavy molecules, you have a very significant enhancement of electron EDM. So for example, if you measure it with cesium, uh, you already have enhancement uh, to the factor of a few hundred. And uh, with francium, it's even better. With molecules, it's much, much better. So uh, the best current experiment uses thorium oxide molecule. And the reason why that's so, so you have a thorium and you have oxygen, and they, they actually kind of share an electron. And uh, inside this molecule, there is a huge effective field. It's 84 
GV per centimeter. So this field is million times larger than anything you can do in a laboratory. This is why people switch from atoms to molecules here. There is extreme enhancement because obviously the larger the electric field, the larger the effect, because remember energy shift is DE. So, and here the electric field is the size of the molecule which you're looking for free. All you have to do is to polarize this molecule. So you apply effective electric field, this molecule becomes polarized. And if you have a dipole, dipole moment, there is an energy shift of the E or effective field. This effective field calculations go to about 10%. So this, and people know what they're doing. It's been confirmed by multiple groups at this point. The, so what you do then, you reverse the field. So here is a field of this direction, and here is a field of this direction. And you look for the shift, which is twice D. So this is actually a very simple idea of experiment. If you have a dipole moment, electric field, there is energy difference, DE. You reverse electric field, now it's minus DE, so the difference is 2DE. You measure the energy difference, that gives you the dipole moment. That's all that is. And it's pretty much as simple for most of the experiments. What's complicated is to ensure that's what causing the shift. It's an EDM and not something in your experiment. So most of those experiments are study of systematic effects. And there is an enormous effort to make sure that nothing really bad happened in this experiment. This is actually why your story of oxide, you don't need in this molecule reverse the field. You actually have two energy levels. If you put electric field, one shifts up and one shifts down. So you automatically measure the difference. You don't actually need to reverse the field. That's called the comagnetometer states. And uh, this is kind of the best type of molecule to do this experiment with. And now, this is an ultimate molecular EDM experiment. And I'll show you sensitivities for all of them. Now, that looks, as you see, as those optical lattices for clocks. There is now a first effort to put molecules in such lattices. If you can do this with 10 to the six molecules coherent to 10 seconds, you can measure new physics at a thousand TeV scale. This is much, much beyond any collider we can conceivably build. And uh, the problem is that this only can be done with molecules which you can laser cool. The sympathetic cooling could, uh, can be done, but generally not efficient. So in order to put molecules in lattice, you need to be able to really trap them to ultra cold temperatures. So people have actually cooled and trapped uh, those molecules. They laser cooled, but not trapped the molecules which they have interest in. However, there is a problem. Unfortunately, this requirement that you have those special comagnetometry states to actually be able not to re reverse the field and the requirement for laser cooling are exactly opposite. You can have in diatomic molecules, you can have one or the other, but not both. It's physically impossible to have both of those effects in the same diatomic molecule just because you need the S state in one case and D states in the other case. However, you could have both in triatomics. That's why the new experiments would like to actually use a triatomic molecules like ytterbium or H, and this is the one which is already under investigation. So uh, as you see, you need this internal commagnetometer state that one shifts with plus, one shifts with minus, and don't reverse the magnetic field. And because you can't cool any of those diatomics, you want to do with a triatomic molecule. In a triatomic molecule, you have this ytterbium, which you use for laser cooling, and you use the OH part for this commagnetometry. And uh, Nick Huxler is a faculty in Caltech, which is actually already working on this experiment with John Doyle and Harvard. And we really think that uh, in say 15 years, we actually have experiment which is better than current ones by several orders of magnitude. So you see there is a clear pathway toward extreme improvement in this case. Okay, let's see if it's just a promise and how good the field has been in the past 10 years. So this is the limits, okay. Those are various type of theories people suggest which actually have uh, generate EDM. The blue one, it's pre-LHC supersymmetry and now the green one pretty much shifted the LHC uh, because of the LHC non-observation of supersymmetry, shifted the limits for the EDMs toward this part. And uh, here you see that this has been factor of 10 improvement 
this been a factor of 10 improvement and this been a factor of 10 improvement. So those things have been improved by a factor of 10 each about each five years. And we do expect uh, very soon actually the next result from ACME and hopefully uh, if you would have it now if not for COVID and it actually will be right here. Now this what ideas which I showed with polyatomic molecules can actually get all the way down to 10 to the minus 33. So if by 10 to the minus 33, we see nothing, you see the obvious problem. We don't have TV scales. We don't have CP violating theories which produce TV scales and not produce EDMs at this point. So in 15 years, if you do not see the EDM and you do not take UCD action, that's going to be a bigger problem. Those are two separate, completely separate problems, but there is a good reason to believe that atomic physics will get there in 15 years. Yes. Is there any time scale to reach the standard model value? 10 to the minus 40. As you see, the standard model, it's somewhere right there. You, there, there is no standard model segment. Uh, standard model, you need three loops to produce uh, electron EDM in a standard model. Not neutron, for the neutron proton, that's different. But for electron EDM, uh, this is way beyond anything. So if there is no scale of TV, <laughs> if there is no new physics at that scale, uh, this is a tremendous problem. So I, I don't know, so people don't have an idea how to get the 10 to the minus 40, but standard, so essentially there is no standard model signal for this one. For neutron ADM, technically you can end up with actually theta term if action doesn't fully restore the, uh, is not actually fully restore theta to zero. And the standard, they are standard model actually a few orders of magnitude away. Here the standard model is nowhere close to anything which is predicted by the, anything which predicts any TV scale physics. Now, the only way you don't see anything here is there is no TV scale physics of any kind, or if you actually have fine tuning uh, of the CP violating angle also at 10 to the minus 10 level. So at this level, we already fine tuning CP angle to about 10 to the minus three right now. So as you see how many orders of magnitude you get. So you end up with a, another problem of strong CP. I mean, it's possible that the phase is vanishingly small for whatever reason, then you could have a TV scale of physics, but no EDMs, but it's very, very hard to come up. Is this a, one more functional problem also? So other questions on the electron EDMs. That's why I started with electron one because here is actually uh, such a clear physics. And again, the electron EDM, it's a size of the width of a human here at the scale of a solar system. That's a very, very precision experiment. And here, uh, somebody asked before, uh, actually to show a comparison to LHC. So this is a comparison to LHC. It is model dependent, of course. So uh, here is the naturalness limits. LHC is in blue and EDM limits are in purple. I'm just going to let you stare at it for a while. It, you see it's a bit complementary to LHC because you're actually sensitive uh, for some of the very specific things with EDMs. So you don't have sensitivity for some of the supersymmetric partners you just have for. Um... But this is in TeV scales. This is already a 30 TeV right now. And you can get to a thousand TeV with this. So any questions on EDMs? Okay, just to give you a flavor, I'm going to show what happens with hadronic EDMs. Uh, the hadronic EDMs, the bad news is that you have a shift theorem. So if you have an EDM inside the nuclei, to the first approximation, it's not detectable because electrons just nicely rearrange to cancel it out. And that's a shift theorem. You put electric field, okay, you have EDM in the nucleus, Okay, electrons get polarized and you don't you see nothing. The good news that if you have relativistic effects, you put some magnetic effects, or you have a deformed nuclei, then this actually lifts to a certain extent. So people have been looking for very deformed nuclei to actually see this and for very relativistic elements. And there are several ongoing experiments. Uh, there is a centric experiment. I just put references for you because I'll put slides. There's a turbimage nuclear uh, magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic quadrupole moment experiment. So those are uh, very novel type experiments. And also people look for EDM in radium, radium fluoride, 
And uh, here it should be very large shift moment. So, and uh, in this case, there a shift moment is a thousand times larger than Mercury. So there's a hope to improve by a factor of a thousand because Mercury is right now the best limit uh, for the hadronic EDMs. And it's actually comparable to the neutron EDM extraction. But the very best thing would be done with uh, uh, PA and there it could be enhanced by a hundred thousand times more than Mercury. We're actually submitting proposal to uh, do that. It's a new rare isotope beams at Michigan State facility to see if we can actually get uh, that measured and see if it's actually possible to use this particular element eventually for the DMs. So as you see, there is a much interesting effort with various uh, more or less complicated systems. Here you have to be uh, then at a special facility, even though experiment itself is tabletop. And some, okay, any questions on the DMs? So I'll be here for lunch. So if anyone's interested, please come in and ask. And here is a very different set of experiments. People have asked if I could talk a little bit about the CPT theorem. Uh, violation. And in this case, you reverse the charge, purity, and time. And technically, uh, you're starting violating Lorentz invariance if you do all three at a time. And micro causality and a lot of bad things happen, but it's nevertheless it's interesting and theoretically uh, interestingly motivated. And there are essentially major experiments based, uh, which measure comparison properties of uh, proton and antiproton, and alpha and a few other antihydrogen experiments which compare properties of hydrogen and antihydrogen. So what you need to do to test the CPT invariance, you pretty much take particle and antiparticle and compare all of their properties, which could be charge to mass ratio, could be the G factor, could be energy levels, depending on what you're actually measuring. And those experiments are uncertain because you either need antiprotons or you need to make antihydrogen. And antihydrogen, it's a, it's a positron which is orbiting antiproton, which is a fantastic experiment. And there have been enormous progress in the past few years. So both base and alpha experiments actually made it in the top 10 of physics breakthrough in 2021 list from physics.org. And uh, those are actually really quantum experiments. So you have this proton or antiproton trap, and they've just demonstrated a sympathetic cooling. So they actually be able to couple the beryllium plus trap to proton trap, the laser cooled beryllium trap, and they actually cool the protons and antiprotons. So they have demonstrated a sympathetic cooling of antiproton a year ago. And uh, as you see how much it improved, this is a fractional precision uh, of the measurements for the magnetic, uh, magnetic moment for the proton. And they improved by what, three orders of magnitude in the past like three years. So this experiment after sympathetic cooling has been demonstrated will significantly increase. So now uh, the CPT has been tested and a range of 16 parts per trillion in energy resolution already at achieving 10 to the minus 27 GeV for this. So the other types of experiments are with antihydrogen <clears throat> and they just also demonstrated laser, <coughs> laser cooling of antihydrogen and uh, the transition frequencies for the hydrogen antihydrogen measured to precision about 10 to the minus eight. So there is a still about three, four orders of magnitude to get to hydrogen precision, but they're actually getting there pretty fast. There is a main issue is producing enough antihydrogen. So now they can producing them in like a thousands, but they literally were counting individual antihydrogen atom. So as you see, there've been tremendous programs. These experiments are uncertain. And just to show, uh, I talked about gravitational wave detection. Uh, so one point which I would like to try to make is that a lot of people saying, okay, so we build LIGO, so good, we detect gravitational wave. But this is like saying, okay, let's do astronomy with just X-ray detector and not build anything else. So the whole point of gravitational wave detection that you would like to detect gravitational wave at all possible frequencies, because they all come from different sources. So to fully explore gravitational wave astronomy, you actually need gravitational wave detectors at all of those regions, at all of the frequency regions. And here are the best ideas. So here is LIGO and here is this LISA. And that's, as I mentioned, where the atom interferometry or clocks can detect the decahertz range. And in this range, the only idea is the clocks and asteroids, and then you actually get the pulsar timing arrays. So in principle, building enough detectors, you can cover the, uh, all of the spectrum. And there is a total new idea right here uh, actually with levitating nanospheres, you can actually detect all the way to megahertz. So this entire range covered, this experiment is being built to the prototype. 
So as you see, there is a really fantastic effort. So uh, there is a hundred meter prototypes being built for automatic interferometers. There is a one in Fermilab and several other, in other places in the world. And uh, just to summarize, so searching new physics with quantum sensors, many, many development is coming next 10 years with EDMs and axions and many other experiments. We actually do hope to see new physics. And what we need is more and more collaborations of particle physics and quantum science field because so many problems as you see to, for, to solve and many ideas to look for. So most of ideas which I actually been telling you about, it's the last 10 years and most of them actually came from particle theory and uh, collaborate with people like you. And if you're interested in this field, uh, please contact me. There are many, many problems to solve. So in 2023 now, so the solving physics problems of 1923 gave us quantum mechanics, a foundation of modern technology. So while we are talking about solving all those problems, dark matter, dark energy, neutrino masses, those are all seem as a very abstract fundamental problems, right? But so did the problems 100 years ago of atomic spectra. No one can think that anything practically useful will come from explaining atomic spectra. But our modern technology is completely based on quantum mechanics right now. So who will know what actually happened from solving the fundamental physics problems? Thank you for your attention. Okay, one other thing. Uh, as I've mentioned, I'm an atomic theorist. So it's very useful for me to get feedback from you about those lectures. So I put a survey actually on that site, this marianasafran.com slash GGI. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you don't need to put your name in there. You can feel as much as, uh, or as little. It essentially just asks you to uh, see whether a lecture has been interesting, whether, they, uh, whether you have any comments, whether you have comments on the project. So let me just show it to you quickly. And uh, I very much hope that you'll be able to fill it in. So this is just for me. This is, this is separate from any school evaluation. And this is only for my lectures, not for the other school lectures. And uh, let me just show you the site just for a second. Uh, slash GGI. Okay. Okay, do we have a network? Yes. Okay, so as you see, if you go, you just click on the very top, there is table to top experience lecture survey. If you just click it, uh, you see a survey, as I said, you, you can skip, uh, you don't need to put your name if you don't want to. So evaluation of lectures and just uh, which topic was interesting. And if you have any other comments, it'd be highly appreciated if you actually fill this out. And that just goes directly to me, not to the school. So thank you so much.